Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Curiosity Studios at the Pacific Science Center in beautiful downtown Seattle. My name is Michael. I will be the educator and the navigator of the nighttime skies today. And uh, actually, you know what? This was the promise I made last week is that uh, we're going to have you all take control. Tell us where we want to go on, uh, where we want to explore, what stories and constellations we want to see together. The way that's going to work is we are going to lean heavily on my friend Zeta. Zeta is on that chat feature. So first of all, can everyone just give a big shout out to Zeta and uh, go ahead and hop on that chat and give Zeta a big hello and let her know how many people are you viewing this with? Who are you sharing this with? Um, yeah, and let's just do some shout outs of, of what Zeta is uh, going to join you in the conversation, going to join me in the conversation and going to join in the nighttime sky. I did get some requests since our last session last week. And so we're just going to go ahead and hop right into it and start exploring those specific things. But as we're exploring the nighttime sky, if there is something really cool that you want to see, go ahead and let Zeta know. Just hop onto the chat and say, hey, I want to go to this place. I do have some rules. Please, let's stick to the constellations of the, what we can see from the nighttime sky because we are backyard astronomers. This is all about backyard astronomy. You can see my nice, beautiful backyard right here. I, I've never been here, to be quite honest. I don't know where this is. <laughs> uh, or let's stick to the planets in our solar system. Okay, so if there's some planets or moons in our solar system that you want to check out, uh, go ahead and pop those in and Zeta will share them with me. But with that in mind, I say, let's just get started, right? Uh, we don't need quick orientation. We've got the Northeast, Southwest uh, navigation. So let's just go ahead and fast forward time. This is what the nighttime sky is going to look like tonight. Tonight, 9.30, just an hour after sunset. And I'm really enjoying it because of, look how beautiful and bright those stars are. This is absolutely gorgeous. All right. Um, so some scenes that I got messaged and some people wanted to see, including my friend Jen from Seattle. She had a really quick question, a really curious question. She heard rumors that there was a 13th Zodiac and that her Zodiac sign might have changed. Well, friends, Let's talk about the zodiacs then. The zodiacs are a group of constellations. So in order to do that, let's pop up all of the constellations in the nighttime sky. Zodiac or constellations are basically shapes up in the sky that help astronomers and backyard astronomers figure out where things are in the sky. And I'm gonna just, you know, spin around in my field really quick. If there's any constellations that you wanna learn more about like Boaties over there or Camel Leopardus over to the north, uh, go ahead and share those with Zeta, uh, and she will share them with me. Uh, but they basically help us map out the sky. For example, last week we were using Cassiopeia to find the Perseid meteor showers. I really hope as a backyard astronomer, you got a chance to see some shooting stars. I went out uh, the following day. I saw six. I was only out there for like 20 minutes. And then all the mosquitoes were getting to me. I didn't take my own advice. I forgot my bug spray. And so I quickly ran back in. But I'm so happy I, I found Cassiopeia really easily. I used these two pointer stars. They pointed to where the Perseid meteor showers were shining. And I got to see some of my shooting stars too. Now, constellations are all about mapping the sky. But there are a few very, very special constellations. They go uh, along what we call the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the path that the moon, the sun, and all the planets take as they move across the sky. For example, you see uh, Jupiter and Saturn. They are right to the south right now, almost due south at 930, really low to the horizon. You see how almost they're lined up? And they're going right across Scorpio, uh, Sagittarius, sorry. They uh, previously were in Capricornus. They were in Aquarius. They were in Pisces. And then as the nighttime sky moves darker and darker, Pisces comes out. And now we see another planet come out. It's in Mars. 
and Mars was following, oh, you could even see Uranus if you had a really nice telescope, through Taurus, and then above Orion's head over to the Gemini, where the Venus is right now, really, really bright in the sky. And then past Venus, and we just turn off the atmosphere, so we're just going to keep it dark nights, even though our sun is right on top of Regulus, the heart and the courage of the lion. This path is what we call the ecliptic. And the constellations that are on top of the ecliptic are what we call the zodiacs. So if you were Leo, uh, Leo's our October birthdays. That means the sun is right on top of your constellation on your birthday. Isn't that amazing? So if you actually want to see Leo on your birthday, it, uh, it, you, you're going to need to travel out of space uh, because the sun is right in the way. The sun is blinding us. So you have to wait until your half birthday to really see Leo. So if there was a half birthday, all we would do is we would spin around and see the constellation that is directly opposite of Leo right now, which might be Pisces, actually. I'm going to fast forward, uh, rewind time just a little bit. You know, it would be either Aquarius or Pisces. Now would be a good time for you to see your constellations uh, out in the nighttime sky, even though you're born more in the you know springtime or in the wintertime. Absolutely. Okay, so why is that important? Well, for astronomers, that's what this is all about. It's about mapping where the moon and the planets and the stars are going to be. And re just a quick reminder, if there's anything that you want to see, go ahead and let Zita know. She will let me know, uh, and we could explore some constellations together. One very special constellation is right out in the nighttime sky. I'm going to keep on uh, rewinding back our time traveling uh, clock right here to 930. So we got Sagittarius there. That's a very famous constellation. That's a very famous uh, zodiac. I used to be a Sagittarius. And then we have another one that the horoscopes really remember. That's Scorpius. It is a giant scorpion. Or if you're from Polynesia of the Pacific Ocean, this this is Maui's fish hook. Maui, that great warrior, had that giant fish hook. He sent it down to the bottom and he started tugging on it and he felt like a lot of pressure on it. And he thought he had like a really, really big, big fish. And so he kept on pulling and he kept on pulling and he kept on pulling and he pulled them all the way up. And it turned out not to be a fish. It turned out to be the two islands of New Zealand were caught on Maui's fish hook. And so he rides those mountains and those islands from the sea. And that's where the Polynesians first started out on those islands of New Zealand. A big shout out to uh, Tanisha. Her August birthday zodiac sign, please, was Leo. The sun is right on top of your constellation right now. And Leos are known for their courage because Regulus uh, is the heart of the lion. In fact, we can even check out. Let's go ahead and check out Aquarius again or I'm sorry, Leo again. To do that, we need to fast forward time. We need to go back to the daytime and just go ahead and look at that shape. What does that remind you of? We're looking at this shape right here. Ooh, they got the space station floating right by uh, Leo Minor. Leo Minor is a little, uh, little uh, lion right above Leo, which is a giant lion up in the sky. Now there's some people who say, hey, that just looks like a big question mark. There's some people who say that looks like a sickle. There's some people who say maybe this is the nose and he's got some whiskers and like a little pointy ear and a little tail going up. Maybe it's Leo the mouse. Uh, but like I said, oh, like I said, Leo is a lion. He was one of the challenges from Hercules. They got in such a big fight uh, and that's such a huge battle that Leo who's proudly being up in the sky. Now is not the time to see your birth, uh, a zodiac sign, uh, uh, Tanisha. You have to wait another six months, and I'm going to have you tell me when is the best time. What is August plus six months? And that's the time you want to see Leo. All right. Now I was talking about my friend Jen from Seattle. She was curious about this 13th zodiac. You see, in the horoscopes, they only put down 12 zodiacs. But astronomers think there is a 13th zodiac, and it's all an accident. It's all about how they map up the sky. Do you see this little kneecap right here, this leg coming right down in between Sagittarius and Scorpius? 
Well, let's zoom out and see who this person is. Oh, friends, that is a giant of a person. That is Ophiuchus, and that is a mouthful to say. Ophiuchus is the 13th zodiac because what is going to happen later on this year is some planets are actually going to move right in between Scorpius and Sagittarius, right across his knee. And uh, that's going to make Ophiuchus uh, the 13th zodiac. The moon is going to go right past his knee, just for a few days, not a very long time, uh, but it's just enough to make Ophiuchus an official astronomer, backyard astronomer, 13th zodiac. Now, who is Ophiuchus? Well, we got some clues here. Uh, let's see, he's got a really nice haircut. Uh, well, he's, he's kind of built, but like, look at what he's doing. He is holding on to two other constellations. He is holding on to serpents, the giant snake. And that's Ophiuchus' story. Serpents, what Ophiuchus noticed is that, well, actually, I just went uh, hiking yesterday up over on the uh, mountain highway loop. And we saw this beautiful snake and, and, and we kind of watched and observed and watched this move. Ophiuchus loved doing that. And what you notice about snakes is that, you know, what's kind of curious is that snakes, they shed their skin. And sometimes you don't even see the snake at all. Sometimes you just see the leftover skin. And so to Ophiuchus's mind, it's almost like the snake was immortal. Like it could come back from life. And isn't that amazing? So Ophiuchus looked at what the snake was eating. And he noticed these herbs and these spices and these tiny little frogs and the juices from the frogs. And Ophiuchus took all of those ingredients that the snake was eating and Ophiuchus created medicine. Ophiuchus is the mythical doctor that keeps us all alive so much longer. He is the father of the pharmacy. He created medicine. And he did such a good job that he himself became immortal. But you know what? The gods, they're the only ones who want to be immortal. So they didn't like that. And so instead of keeping Ophiuchus, who is still immortal, instead of keeping him on planet Earth, they put him up, up in the sky and honored the tradition of what he did by observing the nature around him to help make up the different uh, skies. And what that really means is for the backyard astronomer, because Ophiuchus is this 13th zodiac, guess what? You may no longer be a Sagittarius. You may no longer be a Scorpius. You might be an Ophiuchus. If you were born, and I think it's mid-November is when it actually comes into the sky. Um, the cool thing with that time machine is I think we can actually kind of see if that's actually true. Uh, but unfortunately, my time machine isn't working that way. So we'll just keep on moving on. Move in on. So many great constellations up in the sky. Uh, go ahead and shout out if there's anyone special that you would like to see. We've got a giant lynx. We've got the big bear. We've got Draco the dragon. And we've got Boatsies. Draco is one of my favorite stories because of what's up in the sky, really high in the sky, 9.30 uh, tonight. What I would like for you to do, backyard astronomers, is to look for this very, very special zodiac. Or uh, I'm sorry, not zodiac, constellation. It's going to be high in the sky around 9.30. What you're going to do is look up straight up. That is what we call the zenith. The zenith is basically, well, if the ground meets the sky at the horizon, zenith is, yeah, just look straight up. What you're going to see are three really bright stars. Let's get them all three into our shaky little thing. They are Vega, Deneb, and Altair. They are the summer triangle. They are going to be so bright, the sun is just going to be set. You are going to start seeing these three bright stars. But you're not going to be actually looking for, you're going to use the summer triangle to find out who was the strongest person to ever, ever live. And that person is also high in the sky. We're really spinning around because we are going to be looking to the northwest part of the sky. Oh, I'm sorry. It's almost straight up anyway. So the west part of the sky, what you do is you take denim which is on the tail of the swan. 
and Vega, and they will point down to some actually really did faint stars. The strongest man to ever live was Hercules. Hercules was so strong. Oh my gosh, uh, so strong. He was a half god, half person. And, and basically, he, Zeus just gave him a whole bunch of challenges. One of the challenges was that Zeus had a special apple tree. It's not like the tra apple trees you see out in Ellensburg or Yakima. And by the way, a big shout out to all of our viewers out in Yakima and Ellensburg who are watching us today. This kind of apple tree, they grew golden apples, apples made out of gold. And since it's such a special apple tree, you kind of want to protect it. So what you do, you don't get a guard dog or a guard cat or a guard iguana to protect an apple tree that could grow golden apples, apples made out of gold. What you do, you get yourself a dragon. And so right in between Ursa Major and Ursa Minor is the tail of the dragon, the big dragon, Draco. It is the largest constellation you'll see this part of the uh, planet Earth. Draco was guarding the golden apple tree. And Hercules had to think to himself, all right, even though I'm the strongest person who ever lived, you can't outfight a dragon. They're just too big. They're too strong. You can't uh, hit it with your sword. Their scales of uh, the sword would just bounce right off. You can't uh, wrestle it, absolutely. You might actually be, you know, gobbled up. So what you do is you outsmart a dragon. So what Hercules did, going back straight up, back to that zenith, he played a lyra, or a harp. He played really soft music until the dragon fell asleep. And when the dragon fell asleep, that's when you sneak in and steal a golden apple. Uh, for those Harry Potter fans, uh, you may remember Draco Malfoy. Draco Malfoy is named after this constellation. Uh, Draco the dragon. And you may remember, you know, those dogs with the three heads in that first book? How did Harry Potter get past those, that, that, that dog with the three heads? He played soft music until the uh, dog fell asleep, and then he sneaked right by. Same thing happened with Draco. Now, there are some special stars a part of Draco. First of all, it's a star that it wraps around. It's this star right there on the tip of the tail of the little bear. Right above the big bear right now, it is the North Star, the star that points our way north. You can find the North Star from the two stars at the end of the spoon of the Big Dipper. They point right to the North Star. But, friends, Polaris, that is the official name of the North Star, hasn't always been our North Star. If you were an Egyptian 5,000 years ago, you wouldn't use these two stars to find the North Star you would find these two stars to point to this star right here. And that is Thuban. When the Egyptians were building the pyramids, this was the North Star. And look where that golden apple is. We have one golden apple being wrapped around the tail. We have this golden apple right on the dragon tail. And this all happens because, well, while the earth spins, it has a wobble which means that the North Pole will eventually point at different stars. And one day, very, very far from now, the North Star isn't going to be Thuban. It isn't going to be Polaris. It's going to go right around to one of the stars of Cephas, all the way around to the fourth brightest star in the nighttime sky, Vega. Vega will be our North Star. And look where that golden apple is. Right on the harp that Hercules played to make the dragon fall asleep so that he could steal a golden apple. This is the golden apple Hercules stole from Draco the dragon. So that is a big message to all of you hoping to be nice and strong. Absolutely, please work out, please go outside, particularly to see the nighttime sky, but always remember it is about being smart uh, is a big tool. Uh, to being successful. All right, I'm not seeing any other names or constellation. Uh, Tanisha, thank you so much for shouting out for Leo the Lion. I really enjoy Leo the Lion. That's what made me think of Hercules. 
But I also remember another friend last time was talking about the planet Saturn. Saturn is out in the sky. You just, you don't even have to wait for sunset to go all the way down. Just look south. And what you're going to notice south is a really bright object in the sky. And, well, it's not going to be Saturn. It's going to be Jupiter. Jupiter is a really bright object in the sky. And then as it gets darker, you're going to see another bright object in the sky. It's going to be Saturn. And for our friends, please give me a shout out. We'll go ahead and let Zeta know. Hey, have you and your uh, companions, have you all been joining us multiple weeks? Because I'm curious if you've also made this observation. Over the weeks, we have been doing these planetariums all summer long. And what we have noticed is that Saturn is starting to catch up to Jupiter. They're getting closer and closer to each other from our perspective on planet Earth. Until later on December, they are going to be practically right on top of each other, right on the winter solstice. Saturn is particularly bright right now because its uh, rings are showing. So in order for us to explore Saturn, I say that we just go ahead and do a blast off. So can everyone give us a three, two, one, blast off, going all the way. We're moving away from the solar system. <gasps> Whoa, that was a quick, quick landing on Saturn. Saturn is a beautiful one. And did you notice how it's kind of tilted down? That's really important from our perspective because that means all of these rings, these shiny little pieces of ice, tiny little ice cubes, you know, no bigger than like something that could actually fit in your fingers are shining back on us. Uh, but that's not always true. Sometimes we are right on the Saturn plane and we can really see or not see the rings at all. From Earth's perspective, they almost disappear. And that's because even though there are hundreds of thousands of miles across, the rings themselves are only about a half a mile thick. So thin and so much gap that we have even sent a spacecraft, Cassini, and it danced in between the rings and did exactly what I'm doing right here. We're not really sure where the rings came from, but we suspect that they are very, very young and they're not gonna stay out, um, out for that long. So what time could we see some planets? Like I said, you don't even have to wait for the sun to be completely set. At 8.30, just look south, you will see Jupiter and Saturn come out. And go ahead and spend Get, uh, get your chair out, get your water bottle, and don't make my mistake, get your bug spray and sit down and just let those uh, planets get brighter and brighter in the sky. Watch them move over to the west as the sun moves away and the sky gets darker and darker and darker. And if you really want to see the rings, get a telescope or have a friend with some binoculars who might be able to help you see these beautiful bright rings. They are up there, again, that's a big mystery to us, but we think it's because of something that happened to a moon that broke apart, creating all of this spectacle. Now, just like Jupiter, Saturn has all of these gassy stripes, and that is one of my favorite discoveries they just made like this decade. It's on the very, very top. Look at that. That is a weird shape. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, six sides. It's a hexagon on top. It's not a circle, it's not smooth. For some reason, the very pole of Saturn has this geometric shape on it based on how quickly it's spinning across. And then sometimes what happens, we could tell the sun is facing that way because the shadow of Saturn cast a big shadow across the rings around its uh, rings. Just like if we look down below, we can see those big rings cast a shadow on the southern hemisphere of Saturn. 
Awesome. Now the rings aren't just the only cool things about Saturn. I am noticing that it is carrying a lot of dots. Ooh, a really bright one right over there. I wonder which one, is that Titan? Oh uh, yeah, that's Titan. That is the second biggest moon in our solar system. Um, so big, it actually even has clouds. It's bigger than the planet uh, Mercury. But my favorite moon of Saturn is Enceladus. Enceladus, well, go ahead, everyone. Go ahead and make some observations. Share them with Zeta. What are you noticing about um, um, Enceladus? I want to see if we could pan around and kind of get a Saturn view. Oh my gosh, if you were on a planet, if you were on the moon uh, Enceladus, that is what Saturn would look like to you. Oh, that is just a gigantic view. Gigantic object. And we are so far away, that might give you a clue about what some of the features that you see on Enceladus. Because we are so far away, the sun itself just looks like another star. That is awesome. So, oh, there it is. There's that sun. And we can see the sun from another planet. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, oh, that's Mercury. These are some of our interior planets. There's Venus, the second one. There's Jupiter right next door. But even though it's right next door, its orbit is far away. And that is the Earth from another planet. If you get a chance, definitely check out this selfie from Saturn, a beautiful picture that was taken by our robots we sent to that planet. And everybody on planet Earth waved up in the sky because everybody who ever lived was on that tiny little blue dot right there. And so this is a beautiful, beautiful snowball right on top. Oh, uh, all of that is ice and snow and nitrogen ice. It even shoots out chunks of ice from its geysers and its liquid ocean underneath. Enceladus, it definitely looks gray. Gray almost like Antarctica because it's hiding an ocean of liquid water down below. So Enceladus is one of my favorites because it looks like a great place to go ice fishing. Now we're not gonna go ice fishing tonight. Instead, we are summertime backyard astronomers. And what I would like for all of you to do tonight is to go in the backyard. Go ahead and wait for the lights to go a little bit down. Uh, and maybe your backyard, it may be outside of a local park. Remember, parks close at sunset, so you have to be outside. That's totally okay. Move away from the city lights if you get an opportunity or a chance. Look to the south. Around 9, 30, 10 o'clock, look for Jupiter and Saturn right high in the sky. If you have some time and you're making these observations, go ahead and stay a little bit longer, maybe until 11 o'clock, when Mars is going to start rising due east right inside of Pisces. It is going to be a bright red object. And like we found out earlier in July, there is a spacecraft, a remote control car on its way to that planet right now. And then the final challenge I have for all of you is look up in the sky and make some of your own constellations. Some constellations are actually really hard to see as a backyard astronomer. astronomer. Uh, Copernicus is really hard to see. And even though I'm a big fan of Ophiuchus, sometimes he can be hard to see uh, in the nighttime sky. So sometimes it's just easier to make a triangle or make up your own story of what you see in the sky so that you could see it out tonight. How far away from the Earth are Jupiter and Saturn? That is a fantastic question. And I hope that we could actually explore a little bit more about that next time when we really dive into a bigger tour of the planets. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in exploring how far away is Jupiter and how far away is Saturn, so far away that it make the sun just look like another star in the nighttime sky, come join us next week. Uh, let us know how we're doing. I'm sure Zeta is going to be sharing out a survey right now to give us some tips and tricks about 
how we can make this program even more effective for the school age kids going into school this fall and learning from their distance education away from the school or even at the school for those who need those child care uh, child care options. Please fill out the survey so that we can learn more. We are curious about how we're doing and how we can be better. If you get an opportunity all this summer, this volunteer program has been free. Uh, but it would be great to actually get some financial support so we can continue our efforts into the fall and really support those educators and families. Please let us know uh, and give us some, some support. Visit backside.org and look for that support button. Also, let us know, when are you viewing this? Is this the best time to share our backyard astronomy experience with you? If you have a better time of how to share backyard astronomy, uh, virtual planetarium shows, let us know t what time you're viewing this and what time works for you and your loved ones that you're watching with. And then finally, friends, you've got some homework assignments. First of all, I would like for you to find Jupiter and Saturn in the nighttime sky. I would like for you to find a constellation and make up your own story in the nighttime sky. And I would like for you to explore your curiosity. Be ready for next week with some questions to explore. We love people uh, to share their curiosity and it's by asking really great questions and making observations that we really learn more. So on a big thing, my backyard astronomy friends, I want and I hope that you all stay curious.